Chapter One of Bon Marie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bon Marie: A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Greville, translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter One: A Fish Supper. Those were happy days," sighed the old smuggler as he swallowed his cider and set his glass noisily down upon the table. And we had many a narrow escape. "'One would suppose you were sorry they were over,' said the Coast Guard with a laugh. He knew very well, if Beslin were once started on the narration of his former exploits, that he would not quickly stop, and that he himself might hope for an invitation to supper, in order to hear the conclusion of the tale. But, to tell the truth, it was not so much the supper which the Coast Guard found so tempting, as the hope of catching a glimpse of that rare apparition, Mademoiselle Bonne Marie, who made her appearance at meals. "'Of course I'm sorry,' said the hardened sinner, with an angry thump on the table. "'That was living. Everything was crowded into those days. The dangers of the sea, the danger of firearms always ready to send a ball through us, the danger of breaking one's neck among the rocks with fifty kilograms of smuggled tobacco on one's back. There was some excitement in such things. And now here I am, stranded like an old boat, unfit for service, and spending my time looking out of the window to see what sort of weather it is. "'Do you know what you ought to do, Father Beslin?' insinuated the Coast Guard, retreating a little from his dangerous proximity to the old man as he spoke. You ought to enter our service, and you would be the most useful man among us. What the devil do you mean? exclaimed the old smuggler, brandishing his fist under the nose of his companion, who hastily drew back still further. If you were not the good fellow I know you to be, you should pay dearly for this very poor joke. Do you think I would assist you in catching the fellows who are new to the business in which for forty years I was the cleverest of all my companions? Do you think I would do such a thing? No, you don't. But I will tell you a few things you don't know, clever as you think yourself. I could tell you of places where, this very day, tons of tobacco are hidden. You pass by it, but your nostrils are not keen enough to track it. Here this is smuggled tobacco, and Beslin pushed an earthen jar full toward him. I never smoke any other, as you know very well, and yet you have the audacity to ask me to betray the good fellows who bring it to me? The Coast Guard drew his pipe from his pocket and began to fill it, without seeming to care the least that the tobacco he was using had defrauded the revenue. I was only jesting, Father Beslin, he said, and you know where the stores are hidden, do you? Tell me a little about it. That you can do and not harm anyone, you know. Tell you? No, not much, said the old Norman with a sagacious air. "'But I will tell you a story instead,' he continued, with a knowing wink. "'One day we had landed at the Neige de Jabon with a full load of laces, "'and English tobacco like that you are smoking, only better. "'As the night had been stormy, you Coast Guards, as you call yourselves, "'but spies, as we call you, had allowed us to run in our cargo without interference, "'and the tobacco lay high and dry among the rocks, sheltered from wind and wave. "'But in the morning the weather was glorious,' and all the people poured out of their houses, just as the slugs come out when it rains, only it is just the contrary, you understand. The next day was Sunday, and I went down with the cart to the shore, but it was necessary to pass a revenue station which no longer exists. Then the old smuggler stopped and laughed heartily. "'What amuses you?' asked his companion, who wished to avail himself of all the information possessed by the old man. "'I laugh when I think that one of your captains persuaded the government that his station was unnecessary and had better be removed inland. And why? Because he had a house at Heraquil, which belonged to his wife, and he wanted to let it as lodgings for his men, and now the fellows walk comfortably about it all day long with their hands in their pockets and nothing to do. Oh, your captain was a clever fellow. We have drank many a bottle to his good health, and on the day when he had his house warming at the new station, the Coast Guard bit his lips, while Beslin roared with laughter. "'Well, to go back to my story,' continued the smuggler, when he had laughed enough, I hid my cart among the rocks, and then I went on a little to see what was going on. I found that they had put a bench in front of the station, and all the men were warming themselves in the sun like so many lizards. I was rather puzzled as to what I should do next, when I saw a woman coming down the road with a rosary in her hand. I went to meet the woman. It was just at that time quite the fashion to go on a pilgrimage to the Bain Haro Thomas at Byville, a spring which cures all sorts of diseases. It may not now, but it did at that time, and it seems to me I have heard that devotees have fallen off considerably lately. At that time, too, girls went there in search of husbands. They did not say so, but all the same, that was why they performed the pilgrimage and went off to the Bain Haro Thomas, fasting. 
I saw at once that this good woman was on her way to Byville, for she was newly dressed, and as I told you, held a rosary in her hands. But I did not think that she was after a husband, for she was nearly sixty years old. "'You are performing a pilgrimage, madame,' I said to her as I got near her. "'Yes, sir,' she answered politely. "'Is it far to Byville?' "'Indeed it is,' said the good woman with a sigh, as she looked down at her shoes already white with dust. "'If you choose,' I said, "'I can give you a lift, for I have a stout cart over there. There are some faggots in it, to be sure, but they can be arranged so that they won't trouble you, I think. I'm going to La Grande Vallée behind Vauville. "'Ah,' said my new friend, "'it was certainly Bien Hero Thomas who sent you my way. I will say a prayer or two for you.' "'Very well,' I said. "'Come along with me and get into my cart.' In five minutes more we were seated side by side, the woman telling her beads and I driving my little mare. Up to this time the men at the station had not caught a glimpse of us, but I was sure the very moment they recognized me they would search the cart, and then all would be lost, of course. As we came to the turn of the road I said to my companion, I see my brother in the meadow up there, and I want to tell him not to wait dinner for me, but you can drive on and I will overtake you by making a short cut, which will bring me further down the road. Keep straight on, and don't be afraid, the mare is as mild as a suckling dove. So then I jumped out, and the woman drove the mare quietly alone. When the coast guard saw this venerable-looking female with a rosary on her arm, passed them without showing the smallest haste or anxiety, they, of course, did not trouble themselves about her. She went on until she got to Valville, where I joined her, and jumping into the cart, I whipped up my beast and we flew like the wind. "'My dear good man,' she cried, "'please don't drive so fast. Your faggots are killing me.' There was no use in her complaining. I did not draw on my mare, nor did I even answer her. When we reached the brook in La Grande Vallée, I drew up hastily and helped her out politely. "'I'm very much obliged to you,' she said, "'although your faggots were pretty sharp.' "'The faggots were not the only things in the wagon that are sharp,' I answered. And I spoke the truth, for I had been sharp enough to make by that trip about five hundred francs.' "'That was a very bright idea, Father Beslin,' replied the Coast Guard, after a brief period devoted to a determination that he himself would never allow a cart loaded with brushwood to pass him unsearched. "'And what did you do with all that money?' "'Ask Bon Marie. "'Her education has cost me the very eyes out of my head, and now she's a real young lady. "'She has been educated in the very best school at Cherbourg, and has her diploma. "'Yes, Mademoiselle Beslin is a lady, I am happy to say.' and the old smuggler rubbed his hands with an air of intense satisfaction. "'The fact is, Dr. Beslin,' said the Coast Guard, as he twisted his moustache, "'the fact is, Mademoiselle Bonne-Marie is a young person who is endowed with every possible perfection. She will be the ornament of her sex, and more especially of her husband. If she should be inclined to marry a Coast Guard officer, I think I may say that I am sure of my promotion, and—' "'It is not to me that you must say these things,' interrupted Beslin, with a cunning air. "'I am not a young lady, you know, Monsieur Chamlot.' "'Do you mean, then,' cried Chamlot joyously, "'that you will make no objection and give your consent?' "'I give no consent whatever, sir. "'It is for my daughter to decide. "'She is quite capable of managing all her affairs, "'and I have sworn that I would not interfere with, cross, or even advise her. "'Go to the young lady herself.' Chamelot was not encouraged enough to be enthusiastic, and he took refuge in his pipe and smuggled tobacco. The two men sat for some time in silence, smoking in front of each other. The room was large but low, and lighted by one window, as is the usual in houses of the peasantry in the Hague. The thick walls were of white plaster and held innumerable cupboards with oak doors. The deep window had a long bench which continued around the room, and a heavy table nearly filled the remaining space. It was on this bench that the Coast Guard sat, while Father Beslin occupied a very old armchair, whose straw bottom was replaced by a board and a feather pillow, very much flattened by long usage. The window looked out upon the sea, and on the little harbour of Almondville. The sun was sinking behind the hills, the tops of which still glowed with its rays. The small fort stood out against the blue sky. Not far away, and in the distance, across the deep blue sea, the sharply indented coast was seen the coast that is so picturesque all the way to Cherbourg. "'You are very comfortable here,' said Chamelot, looking out at the closed window. "'Yes, we are comfortable,' answered his host. "'But we have no luxuries about us. This bench and this table, with that bed in the alcove with its red calico curtains, are about all we have.' Beslin was not far wrong. A low chair in the sheltered corner by the fire was Bonne-Marie's usual seat when she was preparing the meals. 
A few cooking utensils hanging on the nails by the side of the chimney attracted the eye by their cleanly glitter. The soup was simmering, suspended from a crane over the wood fire. All was simple, but as the Coast Guard had said, all was comfortable in this peasant home. "'Luxuries do not make happiness,' replied Chamelot philosophically. "'That is quite true, and you ought to know, for you are not rich either,' answered the smuggler with quiet malice. "'Who told you so?' Chamelot answered with some irritation. "'Who told me so?' Why, no one, of course. It does not need anyone to tell me that you would spend your life at the Coast Guard stations if you could help it. It is a very respectable service, nevertheless, replied Charmelot. I dare say, and so is a fire company, murmured Beslin, without taking the pipe from his mouth. Charmelot was trying to find some withering reply to this remark, when the door opened. A ray of the level sunlight poured in, and with it came a visitor. This was a man of about thirty, dressed in a cloth jacket and full of breeches. He pulled off his felt hat and then put it on again. He did not enter the room, but stood on the threshold with a basket in his hand and a heavy net on his shoulder, and apparently waited for an invitation. "'Ah, is that you, Bellevon?' said the old man, shading his eyes with his hand from the sunshine. "'Yes, it is. I—I I came to see if you would kindly accept a few fish.' "'Ask Bonne Marie, my boy. I have no doubt she will, and give you a hearty thank you, besides. Hello, Bonne Marie, come here.' At this shout, a clear, sweet voice from above answered, "'Yes, in one moment,' and steps on the wooden stairs presently announced the approach of the young girl. "'Come in,' said Beslin to the newcomer. "'I will wait a moment, if you please,' was the reply. Bonne Marie now appeared. She was a blonde with the softest blue eyes imaginable, but just at this moment they were bright with mischief. A mass of fair hair was confined by a white cap, and delicately penciled brows and long, sweeping lashes added to the perfection of her charming face. Had she been ugly, the sweetness of her expression would have made you forget the fact, but she was very pretty, and the young people of Almondville knew this very well. "'Here is Bellevon, who has brought you some fish,' said Father Beslin to his daughter, while she was addressing his guests. "'Will you accept them, Mademoiselle Bonne of marie said the fisherman with some hesitation. "'I picked out a few fine fish with the hope.' He pulled away the seaweed which covered his basket, and the sun fell on a dozen magnificent fish with white pearly bellies and glittering prismatic backs. "'You are crazy, John baptiste said Bonne Marie in her musical voice, without one vestige of the nasal twang common to that part of the country. "'What on earth can we do with all those?' "'Eat them, I trust, mademoiselle, for if you will not have them, I shall toss them back into the sea. In fact, I said just those very words to myself when I caught them.' "'Very well, then, John baptiste do not throw them back into the sea, but stay here and help us eat them. "'Here is a friend from the Coast Guard station who will do the same,' said the smuggler with a laugh. Bellevon darted at Chamelot a glance which was by no means very amiable, but Bonne Marie had hold of the basket and was drawing it towards her, and him with it. He yielded to the movement, and the door closed behind her. He was in the room at last. He threw down his net in the corner and said in a low voice to his host, "'Thank you for that good turn, Father Beslin.' The fire soon flamed high in the chimney. The soup was strained and covered and set among the ashes to keep hot. The classic tripod replaced it, and the supper was well started. While Bonne Marie went and came, moving rapidly but noiselessly, and laying the table, John Baptiste prepared the fish in the wavering firelight. The girl turned hastily and stood on tiptoe to reach the utensil that hung high up, and that moment he snatched the corner of her apron and kissed it. The supplicating eyes he fixed on her were more eloquent than words. No one noticed these two, or could hear either of them speak, for the old smuggler was still teasing the coast guard and going off at intervals into explosions of laughter. The girl drew away her apron and said firmly, but by no means angrily, No, John baptiste no. I have only the same answer to make today that I have made before. And why not? murmured the fisherman, trying to soften the girl's obdurate heart with a loving, submissive smile. Because I do not love you enough to be your wife. What can I do to make you love me? asked Jean Baptiste, trembling all over with eagerness. How can a man make you love him? I can love no man who is not my superior, answered Bonne Marie with unconscious cruelty. It is true, murmured the poor fellow bitterly. I am only a poor fisherman, and you are a young lady. Oh, it is not that, replied Bonne Marie eagerly. You have misunderstood me. And why is it then? I will tell you another time. I like you too much to expose you to ridicule, she added gaily. And there looking at us. She flew to the other end of the room, and Jean Baptiste returned sadly to his fish. Her superior, he said to himself, her superior, and yet how happy any one would be in loving her as she desires. Perhaps she will find this superior in this coast guard while I. 
He cast a furious look at the man of whom he was so frightfully jealous. But this jealousy was by no means the work of the young girl who had done all in her power to discourage Chamelot, who, however, was so strongly entrenched in his armor of self-conceit that he was not easily turned aside from his object. Absolute and intolerable rudeness can alone open the eyes of such people. The party was soon gathered around the supper table, and thanks to Father Beslin's caustic wit, of which Chamelot was the victim, the merriment was incessant. Chamelot was by no means dull or foolish, and his repartees were often as amusing as Beslin's attacks. The old man was not restrained, however, by any fear of wounding the pride or feelings of his guests, and his remarks were excessively rude sometimes. Bellevoine was sincerely delighted at each and every attack upon his rival. Besides, he himself was in luck that night, and carried off the honors of war, as the supper was of his providing, and Bonne Marie sat close at his side, so close that her dress and even her arm touched him from time to time. The pleasure of seeing her so pretty and so fresh soothed for the moment the pain caused by her rejection. After supper there was coffee, and this coffee was good and strong, and had a dash of liquor in it. After placing a bottle of brandy on the table, Bonne Marie retired softly, without saying good night to anyone, and the two men proceeded to indulge in strong libations. Chambelot was the first to feel his legs unmanageable. Bellevoine had drunk less, not that he was more sober as a general rule than the men about him in a country where man is more praised than blamed for drinking deeply, but his eyes were on his rival, and he hoped to catch him committing some egregious folly, at which he could have a chance to laugh. Chamelot, after a while, began to talk loud and fast, and Beslin was not behindhand, but after a long chapter of reminiscences, they both grew weary, and the company separated. As he accompanied his guest to the door, Beslin, whose head was steady in spite of some intemperances of his tongue, put a hand on the shoulders of each, all this is very well my boys he said but i tell you honestly if once i see my way clear to do a little business in smuggling i shall try it again i shall try it again and i will help you beslin i give my word on that score now answered bellevoine with a glance of defiance at the coast guard you will help me all right and why shouldn't you your father did many a time and i i should be very sorry of course said chamelot with a profound bow if I were obliged to shoot you down with my gun. But the law before all else, you know. To be sure, the law before all. That is it, my boy. And now to bed with you both, for I think each of you sees double. End of chapter 1 Recording by Susanna Mason Chapter 2 of Bon Marie This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Greville. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 2. The Smuggler. The Coast Guard departed with a most uncertain step and caught at several posts as he went down the road, while John Baptiste marched steadily along towards his distant dwelling. Before going in, he looked at his boat, safely drawn up on the shore, spread his net out on the rocks to dry, and then, shutting the door behind him, went to bed without a light. "'Yes, my boys,' muttered old Beslin. "'Yes, you may hang around here as much as you please, but neither of you will have my daughter. Mademoiselle Beslin is a proud little piece. She's been well brought up, and neither of you are worthy of a girl of her beauty and education. She never said so, to be sure, for she is no chatterbox, but I know it all the same. But she is proud. Whew! Proud isn't the word.' She gets it from me. Her mother was above me in station, but she married me, nevertheless, and not for my money, but for my good looks. Why won't somebody marry Bonne Marie for her good looks? Her eyes are handsomer than mine ever were. Beslin went into the house, rubbing his hands cheerfully, and was soon sound asleep in the great bed, shut in by the red calico curtains. Beslin was in the habit of disappearing every afternoon at a certain time, and during the eighteen months since his daughter's return, she had learned to respect the mystery of his movements and never asked a question. In general, in places like La Hague, where old customs were still preserved, children continue to be respectful to their parents. The scenes of abandonment and brutality which are so often caused by a division of small property, or by the anticipation of it, are absolutely without example in the simple country, where the children are differential to the wishes and obedient to the commands of their parents. Bonne Marie, although raised by education far above the intellectual and moral level of old Beslin, was nevertheless a devoted and submissive daughter. Her hands, which had become wife and delicate in her ten years of boarding-school life, did not now shrink from any domestic task. 
The smuggler's home, so dreary and neglected during the absence of the daughter, who had left immediately after her mother's death, had regained the neat look which had once characterized it. White curtains hung over the only two windows of the house. Soap, sand, and soda had eradicated every spot, and the furniture shone like looking-glasses. "'It was not for such work as this that I sent you to boarding school,' grumbled Beslin sometimes, when coming in unexpectedly he would find his daughter busy with these things. "'I beg your pardon, my dear father,' answered Bonne Marie gaily. "'Cleanliness and housekeeping were the first lessons taught me.' To this Beslin had no reply to make, but contented himself with admiring his daughter. "'I have done,' he said the day that Bonne Marie came back from school under the care of the good woman of the neighborhood who had been sent to Cherbourg for her. "'I have done. I shall do no more smuggling.' "'How then will you live?' asked some of his associates. "'I have something put away,' he answered with a wink. "'And then, too, a pretty girl like mine won't be long in marrying, and my son-in-law can feed me.' This jest was the only reply that anyone could extort from him. And yet Beslin, born a smuggler as it were, for his father had been one before him, now appeared to have given up the illicit traffic. His imprudence was so great in regard to it that one day, when an employee of the government asked him his profession before giving him a certain license for which he had applied, Beslin quietly answered with a wink, "'Smuggler, sir, smuggler.' This jest proved a harmless one, as the employee who knew him well smiled and did not set down the illegal appellation, but substituted another. But people in Amonville and its vicinity asked each other seriously how on earth Beslin would live if he gave up smuggling. And the word live was used in its broadest sense, for his restless spirit demanded excitement and adventure as much as his body did daily food. The house in which he lived was the sole property of which he was known to be possessed, and his house brought him no income. Beslin, however, disappeared every day as we have said. I am going to walk, he would regularly call out to his daughter, and soon his robust form would be seen on the shore. Then he disappeared from view, and no one took the trouble to see where he went. End of chapter 2 Recording by Susanna Mason Chapter 3 of Bonne Marie This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Gerville, Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood Chapter Three, Dreams. The day after the fish supper, the old man departed as usual. Bonne Marie, having put into the daintiest order the little room she occupied in the upper floor of the house, and watered the two geraniums which stood on the window sill, cast a look at herself in the mirror, which imparted to her pretty face a greenish tinge that was far from desirable, and then, with her work basket in her hand, went down into the garden behind the house. Bonne Marie's work was a piece of tapestry of the most glowing colors. What did she intend to do with this tapestry, which was so little in accordance with the house in which she lived and with her daily life? "'I shall use it when I am married,' she would say to the girls of her own age who questioned her. The occasional hours which Bonne Marie found it possible to snatch from the all-engrossing cares of the house were spent, thanks to this piece of canvas, in an enchanted dream. These brilliant wools brought back to her all that she had learned from the discreet romances she had read in her school, in regard to the life of the world and society." Carriages like those she had seen driving rapidly through Cherbourg on the days of the races appeared once more before her eyes. Again she saw the lovely toilettes worn by the fair Parisians in the casino or the watering places, and the handsome men who came down in the trains of Saturday and Monday. Behind this dazzling phantasmagoria was hidden Paris, Paris, that city of the blessed, and it was in Paris that Bonne Marie longed to live. In Paris, she would live in a pretty little house like those in which there are so many around Cherbourg, the homes of people in easy circumstances. She would have a carriage and horses, a hot house, and a garden. Here Bonne Marie cast a contemptuous glance at the poor little garden, planted with a few rustic flowers and many useful cabbages. She would have a wide avenue and a smooth gravel walk shaded by magnificent trees that would always be fresh and green and ornamented by bronze statues, like a certain garden she had seen through the bars of a gate. Her husband would give her all these things, and many others besides. But where was this husband coming from? He certainly would not be found at Almondville. There was no question about this. Bonne Marie did not say this to herself, however, and her reflections were a little vague on this especial point. Some fine day the husband would of course appear. It was in the nature of things. They would meet, possibly, on the shore, and he would admire her at once. 
he would be struck with her distinguished beauty and remain rooted to the ground she much agitated would slowly pursue her way and then suddenly turn around for one more look and this look would decide the destiny of both this future husband might be a painter with his palette and brushes he would pass their house just about sunset one night and he would see her seated just as she was now through the carefully trimmed hawthorn hedge and he would stop to look at her she would raise her eyes and this illustrious being this pride and hope of france would feel that his happiness was there in that modest garden between a hundred leaved rose and a lavender bush bonne marie said a voice behind the hedge she started violently had her dream come to pass at last she raised her eyes and saw the well-known face of jean baptiste what do you want she asked with a burning blush a blush of shame at the remembrance of the fancies and the enjoyment of which she had been interrupted it seemed to her that the fisherman must be able to read them bonne marie tell me why will you not love me jean baptiste was leaning with both elbows on the hawthorn hedge which was so strong and firm that it hardly bent under his weight he was looking at mademoiselle beslin with those plaintive submissive eyes so like those of a faithful dog poor jean she murmured softly not yet quite awake to the real world about her i cannot but it is not my fault nor is it yours but what would you have i am an honest fellow i never did any harm to any one i am a fisherman because i must be something but if you prefer i would go to town and go into trade i could become a grocer you know no no not that answered bonne marie quickly not that not a grocer well just as you please if you say so i am ready to sell all i own here and go to paris this is what you want mademoiselle beslin i have found that out you would like to live in paris i should like it too i think what would you do in paris my poor jean baptiste said bonne marie as she folded her work slowly and you what would you do there answered the fisherman a faint smile flickered over the girl's face little did it matter to her what she would do there she would be rich and respected was that not enough no jean she said gently neither at paris nor elsewhere could i love you have i not said that i must look up to my husband that he must be my master and that is easily done i should say replied jean baptiste angrily your master do you say perhaps you should like to be beaten bonne marie's gentle eyes flashed fire no no she said no man will ever beat me but we understand each other so little my poor jean that it is no use for us to talk and this is precisely why i cannot love you unconsciously she had fallen into the familiar thou which in their class indicated not so much tenderness and affection as the fact that they had grown up together this familiarity delighted the young man and his eyes sparkled with pleasure as he answered books bonne marie have turned your head and the day will come when you will realize the worth of some things you now despise people who are born in the country and have lived there do not bear transplanting it is this earth which nourishes us and we must not be ungrateful you are not made for paris you are in no way fitted for it this is the place for you and where you ought to remain you will see this for yourself some day we shall see repeated bonne marie lifting her head haughtily it is that fool of a coast guard that has put these ideas into your head he is a fool and a traitor beside you prefer him do you he told you he could have a good place be promoted and take you away with him he wishes to go tomorrow with you to beaumont who says so asked bonne marie angrily he says so himself does he indeed well i presume he can hardly go without per permission and you will not allow him then to go with you asked jean baptiste she was silent for a moment and then in a tone of intense annoyance she said i do not love you jean baptiste at least not with the love for which you ask but i do not wish to hurt your feelings or offend you in any way no not for all the coast guards in the world but when i say no it is no you can come if you choose with you no not with me i shall go alone because i do not intend to be your wife but you can come after me and see for yourself how much love i have for this beautiful coast guard in his green uniform bonne marie rose and turned toward the house are you going away said the fisherman sadly it is time to prepare supper good night answered bonne marie she took several steps and then stopped it is very unfortunate dear jean she said 
that you should have taken such foolish ideas into your head, and if at any time one should tell you that I allow myself to be courted by one of these men, you may just tell him to his face that it is false. She entered the house, leaving Jean-Baptiste both sad and happy, as a dog is sad and happy when his food is brought to him, but he is not unchained. End of chapter 3 Recording by Susanna Mason Chapter 4 of Bonne Marie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy in Paris by Henry Gerville. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 4. Going to Market. The sun was just coming up above the high hills which environed the pretty valley of Almondville. The pastures where the tall, crisp grass was green and fresh from early spring until late autumn were lined with the shadows of the tall trees on the summit of the hill. Huge rocks of a soft grey, with patches of emerald green moss, and yellow and brown lichens sparkled with the dew that lay fresh upon them. Masses of heather, at this season of a sombre green, and in autumn of a rich growing purple, lay dark among the firs, which in that blessed country clothed as with the mantle of gold the most arid tracts of land. A light yellow mist shrouded the poplars, whose leaves were just bursting forth while the willows had been in greater haste and were already clothed in their light green foliage. The hawthorn hedges were a mass of white blossoms, like a bridal bouquet, and wound along the high roads and up the hillside in every direction, they being the boundary lines of the fields and meadows. At the end of the valley rose an old mill, built of grey stone, which seemed to block up the road entirely, and to shut out this charming fertile valley scooped out as it were between two hills from any intercourse with the outer world it was midway in this valley that we again catch a glimpse of bonne marie in a short petticoat made of a striped woolen stuff woven in the village and wearing one of those little fluted caps which are so becoming to the girls of this part of the country bonne marie seemed to have forgotten her worldly aspirations and was a mere peasant going to the market at beaumont to buy her provisions for the week on the other side of the valley jean baptiste was quietly loitering along sheltered by the hedge in the intense quiet of the country, at the especial hour of which we write, the slightest noise is heard in great distance. A branch cracking attracted Marie's attention. She looked around and saw Jean-Baptiste watching her through a gap in the hedge. She waved her hand and smiled with a glance of girlish mockery, and the young fisherman withdrew hastily. At that moment a voice rang through the valley. Mademoiselle! Ah! Mademoiselle! Bonne Marie turned a little, a very little, and beheld the coast guard striding through the tall grass of the meadow near the mill. In order to avoid the inquisitive eyes and the long tongues of the villagers, Chamelot had taken the shortest, or rather, the most direct line. But the specious aphorism which pronounces the most direct line to be also the shortest had brought the coast guard to considerable grief already. Whoever has attempted to walk through a meadow near a mill can form any idea of what his troubles had been. The lovely green grass pleases the eye. One starts to cross it, and presently he finds that the green and velvety surface conceals at least a foot of water. Mademoiselle! Ah, mademoiselle! Bon Marie walked a trifle more slowly, but she did not turn around. She swung her empty basket lightly by her side and enjoyed the peaceful scene about her. Charmelot fancied this conduct was the result of her girlish modesty and careful training. He struggled on to join her, but the water was growing deeper and deeper. He took the most enormous strides, and all at once there was a heavy thud. Mademoiselle Beslin knew instantly what had happened. Out of the corners of her eyes she saw her admirer struggling to his feet again, but she knew that his troubles were not over. Each step would bring him nearer and nearer the brook, which was completely hidden by overhanging grass and mint. Bonne Marie slackened her pace. The Coast Guard made a superhuman effort, but his feet slipped from under him, and he fell on all fours into the perfidious brook, accompanied by a sound of splashing water, which was very delicious, and quite in harmony with the cool freshness of the scene. Mademoiselle, ah, mademoiselle, wait for me. This plaintiff's entreaty at last touched the young girl's hard heart. She turned and looked at the pitiable figure before her with a calm, inquiring expression. He, with undaunted courage, had risen from his ignominious position, and leaping the brook, had last reached her side. Bonne Marie was sorely tempted to advise Chamelot to shake himself like a dog. Can this be you, Monsieur Chamelot? said the girl in a voice of light disdain. Where on earth have you been? Jean-Baptiste, as Bonne Marie well knew, was at this very moment enjoying the scene. I came to find you. I thought you would. Here the Coast Guard, exhausted by his struggles, now stopped to breathe, and mopped his forehead with his handkerchief. You wish to go with me to Beaumont, perhaps? Answered the coquette pitilessly. But it is not possible. 
your dress monsieur chamlot your dress why on earth did you undertake to go through the meadows instead of going by the road like a christian how funny you look she could no longer restrain herself but burst into rippling laughter every sound of which gladdened the heart of jean baptiste who in his turn shouted until the whole valley rang caught between these two fires the coast guard turned first to one side then to the other he was covered from head to foot with water and earth and the two young people had started off again in another paroxysm of mad hilarity good very good muttered chamelot pale with rage you shall pay me for this he turned away and took the same meadow path by which he had come caring very little now of course whether he went knee deep into water or not after looking after him for a minute bonne marie shook her head laughed a little more and with a friendly nod to jean baptiste started off at a rapid pace towards beaumont and soon disappeared around the hill end of chapter four recording by susanna mason chapter five of bonne marie this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by susanna mason bonne marie a tale of normandy and paris by henry Javille, translated by mary neil sherwood chapter five the night after the evening of the same day bonne marie came home from her long exertion fatigued and taciturn her morning gaiety had all passed away and as often happens with young girls after having laughed until the tears came the tears now came without laughing it was indeed hard for a spirit as ambitious as her own to conquer her pride and go to market like any simple peasant lass after her recent dreams of luxury and wealth it seemed to her especially painful to return to her home on foot bowed under the burden of a basket filled with provisions accompanied by a group of the young girls of Amonville, who were totally uneducated almost uncivilized in whose conversations she could feel no interest and by whom it was perfectly easy for her to see she was neither loved nor liked it was then with a very full heart that bonne marie ascended to her chamber after having said good night to her father who kissed her with more than his wonted tenderness the old smuggler had done his best to make his child happy and if he had not succeeded what was there left for him to do dear little girl said the old man to himself as he listened to his child footsteps on the uncarpeted stairs you shall be happy in this world if i can manage it he waited another hour and listened to satisfy himself fully that his daughter was asleep then he took from a corner a stout oaken staff without which he never went from the house then going to his wardrobe he took out something that he had in his pocket extinguished his lamp and went out softly now he said with his customary knowing laugh everybody's asleep in the moon alone he interrupted himself for the, all the world was not asleep lights glittered here and there in the windows of some of the houses and a little further on was the coast guard station through those shutters of which came a ray from a shaded lamp beslin bowed mockingly toward this lamp perhaps you will find out some fine day my boys he said aloud that father beslin is not so old but that he can do some mischief yet he went to the left and along the shore sheltered by low stone walls which protected the low-lying meadows from the encroaching tide walls which however there were by no means high enough to prevent the same meadows from being flooded when the sea ran very high under a stiff northerly breeze his step resounded for a moment on the flat stones on which he trod and then he stood still and listened the regular ripple of the incoming tide the dash of the waves against the rocks which were covered and left bare twice each day by the water that was all he heard no other sound save this monotonous beat of the pulse of a great ocean and the charge of the indefatigable waters against the rocks which stood firm against their assaults beslin walked on but the noise of his boots on the shingle was so loud that he went down to the sand and entered the water ankle deep following the shore through the white foam the night was very dark a soft northeasterly breeze so light on land that it scarcely lifted the leaves of the trees drove the sea against the belt of reefs which protected the hog better than the cannons of any forts could have done again and again did beslin stop and listen still no sound but the ripple and the dash the old smuggler resumed his nocturnal walk he reached a slight eminence an island almost connected with the land by a narrow tongue of earth nearly eaten away by the water and often entirely submerged on this spot were the ruins of an old coast guard station long since abandoned the gulls and cormorants were now its only visitors and these birds took refuge there on many a stormy night when the waves washed over the rocks which were their habitual homes it was not a bad idea muttered the hardy adventurer to hide our goods in a very spot 
that belonged to the government. They never would get the idea through their stupid brains. He shrugged his shoulders as he thought of Chamelot. He then went around the abandoned station and knocked several sharp blows in quick succession on the stones. A head peered cautiously out, and then another. It is I, he said, quite aloud, without the precaution of lowering his voice. Come, my boys, the night is very dark, and you can keep close to the rocks, walking through the water. Remember what the sailors say. The salt water never wets anyone. Setting the example himself, he lifted a bundle on his shoulders, and entered the water until it came as high as his waist, and then stole along behind the rocks with the greatest caution. Two men, more heavily burdened than he, followed him closely. It was necessary to make a circuit of at least half a league, all the time beaten against by the rising tide. Every few minutes a hole presented itself which it was necessary to step over. Old Beslin had gone over this route over and over again, and without the smallest fear of being heard, as he trusted to his voice being covered by the roar of the sea, he gave his companions directions so precise that they were really astonished. "'Have you eyes in your ankles, then, Father Beslin?' asked one of his companions, a newcomer in that district. They were resting at the moment behind a large rock which prevented them from seeing the shore. "'Yes, my boy,' answered the old smuggler, as he eased the burden on his shoulders and started again. "'I have eyes in my ankles, and at the ends of my fingers also. You see, a man must know pretty well what he is about before he undertakes to lead others.' They had now reached a spot where the high rocks ended, and low ones, covered with wet seaweed, took their place. They would now be obliged to cross the beach on their hands and knees, keeping as flat to the ground as possible, and try to reach the fields beyond. "'Now look out,' said Beslin in a low voice. "'This is the most dangerous place we have.' Just as he spoke, and was about to leave the protecting shadow of the last high rock, an odd metallic sound was heard on the beach. "'The ghost card,' said Beslin, between his teeth. "'I felt sure that that beast of a chamelot had followed me.' "'Who goes there?' cried a voice not ten steps off. Three smugglers stood huddled together. The tide was still coming in, and the foam touched their lips. "'Who goes there?' repeated the Coast Guard. Father Beslin breathed, rather than whispered, one of the men. I'm losing my foothold. The tide is too strong for me. The guards were talking together, and they moved a few steps away. Are they going? said one of the smugglers. No, answered Beslin. They are not going. They intend to climb over that rock. You go back, and I will keep them here. After you have gone thirty or forty yards, cross the beach boldly, and strike into the fields. They will never think of looking for you there. "'But you, Father Beslin?' asked the others, with some anxiety. "'I? Why, I shall say that I am taking a walk for my health. They may believe me, or they may not. That is their own affair. Go on, my children, and take care, and keep the goods dry.' As the tide was still coming in, there was not much time for hesitation. The two men reluctantly beat a retreat, keeping behind the rocks and obeying the directions given them by their guide. The Coast Guard were at a loss of what to do. They had returned to the beach, and the quick, sharp sound of their guns rang against the pebbles. Beslin held his breath and his ground. Unfortunately, a wave rising a little higher than the others swept off his hat, which stood out clearly on the white foam that broke on the beach. "'There is certainly someone there,' muttered one of the guard. "'No,' answered Chamelot. "'I do not think so, but we can easily ascertain.' Another foaming wave struck against the rock behind Beslin, and threw his figure out in strong relief against its whiteness. "'If there is no one,' replied the man, "'then it is a seabird for something moved. Look there.' Beslin drew back a little. "'Fire!' cried Chamelot, not, however, without some repugnance. A flash of light, a quick report. Beslin was thrown by the next wave almost at the feet of the man who had often sat at his table. The Coast Guards turned their dark lanterns upon the body and recognized Beslin. A ball had gone through his forehead. A sigh and a shiver, and all was over. End of chapter 5. Recording by Susanna Mason. Chapter 6 of Bon Marie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bon Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Jouville. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 6. Before Dawn. The clock struck one just as the dreary procession reached Beslin's door. The shot had aroused all the village. The fishermen had hurried down to the shore, and some among them had gone on to Beslin's house to awaken Bonne-Marie. 
but when they reached the door, the heart of the boldest failed him. "'I will call her myself,' said Jean-Baptiste, trembling with grief and suspense. "'In the hour of trouble one turns to old friends.' He ran up the stairs and tapped at the young girl's door, but the lover was lost in the tenderest pity. He felt all the compassion of a brother for a heartbroken sister. "'Your father has had an accident,' he said as he opened her door, all in white. "'Come down quickly.' She hurried on a skirt and caught a shawl, without speaking one word. Jean-Baptiste led her to the side of her father, where he lay with a sheet thrown over his face. Every head was uncovered, and the only light came from the lanterns. "'Is he dead?' she gasped. No one answered. She knelt at the side of the body, but her light form swayed like a reed in the wind, and she fell back into the arms of Jean-Baptiste, who laid her on her father's bed. The good women of the neighborhood gathered around her, and she was soon restored to consciousness. "'Who killed him?' she asked some hours later, when the gray light of dawn paled the candles burning at the head of the bier. "'It was Chamelot,' said one of the women. "'Your father was smuggling.' "'Yes,' said Bonne Marie faintly, closing her eyes as she spoke. "'He said he would be avenged.' Meanwhile, Chamelot was by no means as guilty as Bonne Marie supposed. He had watched Beslin, and followed him with the hope and expectation of taking him in the very act, but he had not dreamed that a murder would take place. Unfortunately, however, he was pushed to extremity by the imperious law of his position, and had obeyed it not without the greatest reluctance and horror. The villagers and all the peasantry avoided him after this event, and would go out of their way to avoid him when they met him by chance. Chamelot found this so very disagreeable that he asked and obtained a change, and this he did with so little delay that when Bonne Marie, according to the severe provincial etiquette in regard to mourning, went to church for the first time a fortnight after her father's death, it was with the comforting assurance that she ran no risk of meeting the man whose very name turned her sick and faint. End of chapter 6 Recording by Susanna Mason Chapter 7 of Bonne Marie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Javille. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 7. Departure. Six weeks had elapsed since Beslin's death. Spring was changing into summer, and soon the fires of St. John would be lighted in all the villages under the wreaths of flowers suspended across the streets. Bonne Marie had silently set her house in order for a long absence, and one day Amonville was surprised to learn that Mademoiselle Beslin was about to depart. "'Where is she going?' the gossips said one to another. This question was not an easy one to answer, for since the great misfortune which had crushed her to the earth, Bonne Marie had not exchanged ten words with a living soul except the cure, who had visited her several times. Jean-Baptiste walked to and fro past this house, looking at the windows over which hung those impenetrable white curtains. Never once had he ventured to knock at the door, so intense was the respect he felt for the orphan's sorrow, and perhaps also for the solitude of this defenseless and solitary young creature. One Wednesday evening, however, the door was opened to let in the light of the setting sun, and the young fisherman ventured to approach it. Bonne Marie was unquestionably expecting him for she showed no surprise when she saw him. She was standing in the centre of the lower room, packing a small trunk that stood on the oak table. "'Good evening, Bonne Marie,' said Jean-Baptiste, not crossing the threshold, but standing just outside the door. "'Is it true that you are going away?' "'Good evening,' answered the girl in her sweet, musical voice. Then, after a moment's silence, she said slowly, "'Yes, I am going away.' "'And where, if I may ask?' She hesitated. "'To Cherbourg,' she answered, turning her face away, but a rosy flush that spread over her cheek and throat told that it was not easy for her to tell a falsehood. The young man entered the house and stood on the other side of the table, looking at her. "'You are not going to Cherbourg,' he said sadly. "'Or, at all events, you are not going there only. You intend to go to Paris.' Bonne Marie assented with a silent nod and went on folding her linen and stuffing it in the trunk. "'Why are you going to Paris?' continued the fisherman in a gentle voice. "'You might be very happy here. I would work for you, and you would be a little queen. You need not trouble yourself about anything but your embroidery and your flowers.' "'I cannot stay here,' interrupted the young girl. "'You know I do not like the country, and now, 
after this last horror it is simply killing me each of those rocks the roar of that sea tells me the frightful tale over and over again and i really cannot bear it she was silent and her fluttering hands were still for a moment while two large tears splashed upon the black shawl she was folding so be it sighed jean baptiste but you will come back bonne marie looked vaguely out over the open door through which came the gay sunshine thousands of luminous particles floated in the air and were swallowed up in the heavy folds of her black dress the sun told the tale of hope and of life and a sigh swelled her youthful and ambitious breast perhaps she answered slowly and with a faint smile upon her parted lips jean baptiste stood for a few moments in bitter silence he was angry and he was wounded he knew that he had no real right to be either he hesitated and then going nearer to the girl he looked her full in the face listen he said you will come back not in a carriage proud and happy and with the gorgeous raiment of which you dream no you will return poor sad worn and weary and possibly ill besides you will find me here waiting and watching for you bonne marie you will perhaps be less proud and less confident than you are today and i bonne marie will be then just what i am now she looked at him with an air of defiance his words had wounded her keenly he saw this yes he resumed in the same cold tone but with a gentle expression in his face you are vexed with me and yet i have said only what i believe you will return here because you will not know where else to go when paris becomes to you as irksome as omneville is today because he stopped bit his lips and determined to say no more but in a moment he spoke again with that resigned sweetness which lay at the foundation of his character i know not what other changes there may be bonne marie but i i shall never change Intense silence reigned in that low room, while the two stood apparently expecting some mute sign from the finger of destiny. "'When are you going?' the young man asked at last. "'Tomorrow morning,' replied Bonne Marie, shutting the lid of her trunk. All her firmness returned to her with this simple act, the prelude of her new life, and she turned toward Jean-Baptiste. "'Be happy,' she said to him. "'Farewell.' farewell he repeated will you allow me to kiss you they were alone and yet jean baptiste was so serious and his face was so sad that the girl never dreamed of refusing their cheeks touched three times according to the custom of the province where correctly speaking they do not kiss and the young man went out without once looking behind him end of chapter seven recording by susanna mason Chapter 8 of Bonne Marie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bonne Marie, a tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Jeville. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 8. Arrival in Paris. The next day, the sun had been up about an hour. The resplendent sky was flecked here and there by the fleecy cloud when the heavy Almondville stage, drawn by two sleepy horses, began the rough ascent of the road to Cherbourg. According to the old established usage, all the passengers walked up this hill. Bonne Marie alone sat still by the side of the conductor, a surly old animal. As they drove past the spot where she had last spoken to Chamlot, the girl could not repress a shiver of horror. Involuntarily, her eyes glanced over at the hedge, through which, on the same day, she had caught a glimpse of Jean-Baptiste's laughing face. He was there, but pale, and so changed by grief that he looked as if he had risen from a bed of illness. She waved her hand to him, and, absolutely without her own volition, her last glance was one of tenderness and pity. The conductor touched his horses at this moment, and the stage moved rapidly on with a great rattling of wheels, and Jean-Baptiste, after watching it disappear at the turning of the road, went sadly back to his home. He wandered restlessly about his house without being able to find any spot that pleased him, and at last went to his fishing boat and untied it from the stake to which it was moored. "'Why, it is low tide!' cried a crowd of mischievous, inquisitive urchins. 
Are you going crabbing in your boat? Without paying any attention to this childish impertinence, Jean Baptiste rowed rapidly toward the open sea and then put up his sail. Thanks to the wind which was favorable, he had gone far enough to the east at the end of an hour to catch a glimpse of the cumbrous yellow vehicle, creeping like a tortoise toward Landemere. But this consolation was his last. The stage disappeared among the trees, and the fisherman had nothing left to do but to amuse himself by casting his nets until the wind and the tide favored his return to Almondville. The curé had given Bonne Marie several letters of recommendation addressed to ladies in Cherbourg, and the young girl herself meant to apply to her old teachers at the boarding school where she had been educated. With all this influence exerted on her in her behalf, she thought there would be no difficulty in procuring some situation in Paris. As a servant, by no means, but as an under-teacher somewhere, as a governess in a family, perhaps, and after that, well, the future was in the hands of her heavenly father. After two days passed in going from house to house, receiving excellent but generally most unpracticable advice, Bonne Marie went to the railway station and, with all the hesitation and timidity of an inexperienced traveller, purchased her ticket, and the next morning, after a sleepless night, arrived in Paris. After the bewilderment of the first hour, after the hasty breakfast swallowed in cremerie, the usual resort of coachmen and draymen, where her beauty won her for her several compliments, which seemed to Bonne Marie like so many stings of a lash across her face, the young girl found herself in La Rue de Havre, where the morning sun gilded the fronts of the high stone houses and shone on the balconies filled with flowers and vines. The rumble of wheels had in some degree died away. Now that the hour was past for the arrival of the trains from the country, a gentle animation had succeeded to the crowd and a bustle of the earlier morning. Bonne Marie asked her way and went toward the Madeleine, timid and fearful, and yet with a hopeful heart. End of chapter 8. Recording by Susanna Mason. Chapter 9 of Bonne Marie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Cheville. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 9. Mademoiselle Beslin. The school with the address of which Mademoiselle Beslin had been furnished was near the Champs Elysees, and assisted by several persons who answered in her inquiries with courtesy, the young stranger found herself at last before a dark green door, on which was inscribed in large letters, Institution Bocard. The bell which Bonne Marie had lightly touched rang through the house. A dog barked outrageously, and just as the young girl, after waiting long and anxiously, had decided that she would rather go away than again awaken all this clamor by another appeal to the innocent-looking knob that seemed to be the offending cause, the door opened and the pointed nose of a precise and neatly dressed concierge nearly hit Bonne Marie in the eyes. "'What do you want?' asked the woman, who, as she examined from head to foot, the country girl whose simple dress and provincial mourning indicated no great amount of the goods of this world. "'I should like to speak to Mademoiselle Bocard.' "'Mademoiselle cannot be seen at this hour. She is taking her chocolate,' said pointed nose in a tone that was the reverse of polite. "'I have a letter,' replied Bonne Marie so haughtily that the concierge repented of her rudeness. "'Mademoiselle will receive you at twelve she answered more civilly. "'If you choose to give me a letter, I will—' "'No, thanks,' answered the girl, remembering that she had been especially advised to see the persons to whom the letters were addressed. This prudence raised her to an enormous height in the estimation of the concierge, and induced her to say, "'If you will come back at eleven, I shall tell mademoiselle.' "'Thank you,' said Bonne Marie, with a gracious bow, and turned away, leaving on the mind of the astonished concierge the impression that she was a foreigner— and a countess who wished to penetrate the interior of the school in disguise, for some reasons of her own. Three hours is a long space of time to get rid of, when one has nothing to do and feels utterly alone and dreary. Tired from her sleepless night, fevered by her journey and her anxiety, Bonne Marie went towards a green mass of waving boughs and leaves that she saw at the end of a street, and soon found herself in the Champs Elysees. She seated herself on a bench in the shade of friendly trees, and looked with all of her eyes. Yes, this was the scene and the life of which she had dreamed. It was amid these fragrant flowers and these sparkling waters, for the hydrants were running freely, washing the dust from the turf and shrubs. It was surrounded by these fantastic cafes and restaurants, 
that the girl felt her real life would now begin. She should soon see the carriages and foaming horses, with difficulty reined in by livery coachmen, whose existence had hitherto been only in her imagination. Bonne Marie's heart swelled with joy and pride. She was in Paris at last. Several old beaux passed her on horseback, but they took no notice of the pretty creature half hidden among the azaleas. An occasional young man, irreproachably dressed, with that indescribable air of good society, would also appear in the distance. Bonne Marie watched them all with intense interest and curiosity. Those are the people, she said to herself, with whom I ought to live. But the girl felt no impatience. She was so near the realization of her dreams now that she could afford to wait. She held her chimera by the wings, and she could feel it flutter under her fingers. A clock struck eleven. Whence came the sound she knew not, but it rang out clearly, detaching its strokes, as it were, from the confused sounds and distant roar of carriages. Bonne Marie started, but it was with considerable difficulty that she rose, for all her limbs were stiff with fatigue, and returned to the pension. She was received this time by Mademoiselle Bocard, who was as smiling and urbane as her concierge had been the contrary. She was as round as pointed nose had been sharp, figure and face, movements and smiles were all as soft and luxurious as an eastern rug. Bonne Marie was dazzled by this amiability, and thought herself on the threshold of paradise. "'You desire to find a situation, do you, my child?' said the lady kindly. "'It was Monsieur Martin who sent you to me, that most estimable of curés.' "'Yes, mademoiselle, it was Monsieur Martin, my curé, who has known me from childhood,' answered the young girl, lifting her eyes to those of the lady. "'Ah, uh, I have heard of you before. If I am not mistaken, you have not recently lost your father.' Bonne Marie colored and assented silently. It cost her a heavy pang to feel this recent wound touched by this strange hand. By an accident, I believe. The caressing eyes of Mademoiselle Bocard met the troubled ones of Bonne Marie, and would unquestionably have succeeded in exhorting from the girl the secrets of her innermost heart, if that heart had happened to contain any. Tears prevented Mademoiselle Beslin from replying. The lady looked at her more sweetly than before. You have your diploma, I presume? Ah, yes, to be sure. You wish to be an under-teacher, but do you know anything of the duties of this position? I think and hope I do, answered the girl, for I was eight years at boarding school. What a frightful Cherbourg accent, thought Mademoiselle Bocard. Nothing can be done with her. Yet she continued to smile on the stranger, thinking that if she would consent to come without any salary, that she could dismiss the young girl just engaged to take care of the smaller pupils, and who was without a fault except that of costing twenty-five francs per month. "'You have some means, I presume,' insinuated Mademoiselle Bocard, "'and it is for the sake of a home and to perfect yourself in your studies that you desire a situation?' Bonne Marie understood the drift of this question instantly. Her clear Norman sense stood her in good stead in this emergency. She answered, therefore, while she mechanically put her hand to her breast to satisfy herself, that the little pocket-book containing the two notes of a thousand francs each, which were sewed up in her father's mattress, was safe. I desire to perfect myself, mademoiselle, in all things, but I have no fortune, and I must rely on the work of my brains or my hands for the means of support. My readers have many of them seen the toy door close and the cuckoo who comes out to say the hour, in those tiny little clocks manufactured in the black forest. Accustomed as they may be, the sudden and invariable disappearance of the bird, they are none the less astonished each time it takes place. Just in the same way did Mademoiselle Bocard smile and depart, leaving no trace behind her. Unfortunately, she said, our number of teachers is complete. If Bonne Marie had clasped her hands in supplication, and raised her lovely eyes swimming in tears, if she had implored her to save her from poverty, it is possible that, that the directress would have taken her out of pure compassion. In the place of the other who cost twenty-five francs, on the condition be it understood that the newcomer received no salary. But nothing of this kind occurred. Mademoiselle Beslin, in a salutation so dignified and graceful, that it impressed the teacher, rose, and turned toward the door. How well she carries herself, thought Mademoiselle Bocard, but her accent is positively deplorable. Call again, she said aloud, about the time of the vacation, and it is quite probable that there will be some changes in the staff at that time. Many thanks, Mademoiselle, Bonne Marie answered with that haughty grace which had been bestowed upon her from some fairy godmother in her cradle, and she went away. 
Mechanically, she turned her steps toward the champs elysees again. The entire air and look of the place had undergone a marked change. There were no more carriages to be seen. The equestrians had disappeared. The few equipages had no coats of arms on their panels. They were from the livery stable, and contained people from the country, or strangers who were wandering about from morning until dawn, ever admiring the beauties of the capital. All at once, Bonne Marie realized that her appearance was the same as that of these country people. It was the sight of a woman in deep mourning that had done this work of enlightenment, and opened her eyes to this uncomfortable fact. This woman was walking very fast, but with a smooth, gliding step. Her dress was rigidly plain, and her black cashmere shawl was precisely like that worn by Bonne Marie. Her small hat of black crepe, with its long veil, had cost no more than the beribboned one worn by this young girl. And yet what a world of difference in the hangings of those skirts, in the folds of that shawl, and in the way in which the hat was worn. I am absurd, said Bonne Marie to herself, but it will not last long. At Cherbourg she had obtained the address of a small hotel, kept by honest people. She now went there, for, however indomitable her spirits might be, her bodily strength was leaving her. Her quiet manner secured her instant admission, and the mistress of the house at once took greatly into her favor, this young girl who set herself at work so courageously to win her bread. Bonne Marie was therefore happy in the thought that she had a shelter, and was safe from the many perils which assail women on the slippery pavements of Paris. That same day, towards evening, the girl started out once more, and went to various other persons to whom she had letters. Everywhere she was received in the same way, and with the same result. At one place, however, she was offered a class of twenty pupils. At twenty francs per month, breakfast would be given her in addition, but her dinner and her lodging she must provide for herself. She went out with a dull rage in her heart at such rapacity, and asked herself how women could live who accepted such conditions. End of chapter 9 Recording by Susanna Mason Chapter 10 of Bonne Marie This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Cherville Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood Chapter 10 Clotilde Two weeks had elapsed. Bonne Marie had no more letters to deliver. She had been everywhere, and furthermore had answered a number of advertisements for governesses and the like, but all without avail. She had begun to think, seriously, of going into service, when the idea struck her that she could use her talents for embroidery. It was then that the girl realized for the first time the small value set on such labor. She was offered twenty francs for embroidery that would have been worth five hundred, and was required to leave a deposit the worth of the materials. After the fourth attempt in this direction, Bonne Marie saw she could never hope to earn her bread thus, and admitted with death in her soul that Paris was no place for her. "'What shall I do now?' she asked herself, as she wandered sadly along one of the bridges. "'Where am I to find an asylum and a crust?' Each day she went to the Champs-Élysées, and there her strength returned to her, as did that of Antaeus in touching the earth. The mere sight of this mirage was to her a glimpse of the promised land. Her mourning and her quiet reserve spared her many of the disagreeable occurrences, which, had her air been different, would most assuredly have beset her at this period of her life. She took her seat, therefore, daily, between the hours of three and five, on a bench near some of those gorgeous nurses and those dimpled babies with their sweeping skirts, and she watched the incessant flow of equipages and foot passengers who, at this hour, take their way to the boys. One day, finding that the bench she usually occupied was filled with country people, she wandered on a little further, and found herself opposite one of those concert cafés which attract, night after night, that very large class of people who do not enjoy the solitude of their own apartments. This class is far more numerous than it is usually supposed, for among the people who tread the Parisian pavements, from five o'clock to midnight, there are fully half who do this, to avoid the solitude of a home where nothing pleases them. Bonne Marie passed on a little farther, and seated herself on a bench by the side of a path that led from the avenue to the Café Chantant, which, although newly opened, was already very fashionable. With her hands loosely clasped on her knees, she sank into a sad reverie. Her small treasure had been seriously encroached upon already. Autumn would soon be there, and then what would she do in those dark, dreary days? Must she make up her mind to return to Almondville? 
and bear the ridicule which she knew would be her portion the young girl's pride was as deeply wounded at this thought as if a stranger had insulted her never she said to herself never there was a rehearsal going on at that cafe chantant apparently for several women had passed mademoiselle beslin with rolls of music in their hands their toilette was in no means remarkable their air was that of the ordinary parisian who is always carefully dressed bonne marie was far from suspecting that these women so like all others in her eyes would appear that evening to more than one provincial as beings from a different sphere two or three young men who seemed to be waiting for some one were lounging about also each with his roll of music under his arm la diva here comes la diva said one of them indicating by a look a coupe which was drawing up at the side of the pavement the young men hastened towards it with an air of laughing and possibly exaggerated respect bowed to the lady who emerged from the carriage which drove away hastily and the diva bowing to all her friends with one comprehensive greeting slightly raised her long skirts of silk and lace with one hand and moved towards the cafe bonne marie contemplated this scene in a listless sort of way she was heartsick as well as physically weary she thought these men very silly and the woman extremely insolent what a pretty blonde said one of the young men in a low voice attracting the attention of the diva to mademoiselle beslin the lady turned her superb black eyes on bonne marie and stood still in utter amazement bonne marie turned a haughty supercilious face upon her i beg your pardon mademoiselle said the singer with some hesitation but you are so astonishingly like one of my old school friends she turned away but bonne marie started up clotilde she exclaimed clotilde have you made your fortune this artless question brought a smile to the lips of more than one hearer but clotilde did not care she laughed heartily not exactly she answered gaily but where on earth do you come from bonne marie why are you here not because i have made my fortune of that i am quite sure answered mademoiselle with a forced smile and you would repair this negligence of fate i fancy interrupted her old friend i should not think it so difficult a matter for you are wonderfully pretty but you are in black mademoiselle clotilde they are waiting for you to begin the rehearsal a well-shaven individual now came to say that he belonged to the concert troupe was and not the cafe was easy to see when his emaciated figure was contrasted with those the well-fed waiters mademoiselle clotilde shrugged her shoulders that is always the way she murmured where are you living bonne marie the girl told her heavens and earth why are you in such a place said the singer with uplifted brows i cannot go into such a part of the town come and see me when asked bonne marie with quickly beating heart tomorrow morning at eleven and la diva handed a card to her friend and disappeared behind the vine wreathed door when she was alone bonne marie looked at the card on which these words were inscribed mademoiselle clotilde dramatic artist dramatic artist repeated the young girl then it is on the stage that fortunes are made and why not she returned to her small lodgings and all about her seemed changed the old mahogany wardrobe the large figured curtains the coarse cotton sheets which were especially horrible to her who had always been accustomed to the lavender scented linen which alone is used in the provinces now filled her with disgust the dinner she could not eat the smell of cooking made her head ache and the noise from the restaurant was insufferable for it penetrated even to the remote room she occupied all these poor details now seemed absolutely squalid in her eyes how different it all was from the silk dress of clotilde and the perfume which exhaled from her laces and ribbons bonne marie passed a wretched night was up and dressed at daybreak and busy in giving to her simple black dress as good an appearance as possible long before the hour appointed she was on her way to the quarter inhabited by her brilliant friend and had ample leisure to admire many a sumptuous dwelling the windows shrouded in lace the furniture seen dimly through these curtains the mirrors which gleamed from under those italian awnings extended to shut out the august sun all attracted her and strengthened her and revived her ambitious dreams at last the clock struck eleven and she pulled the bell of a door painted light grey the house was coquettish and dainty a woman servant appeared and bonne marie was shown into a salon that realized all her dreams 
It was only cretonne, but it was all so fresh and pretty. The woodwork was painted in light grey, with slender lines of gold, and the portieres and curtains were a rich red. Boiled furniture harmonized with the subdued tones of the coverings. Flowers and masses of green were seen everywhere that a vase or a flower pot could be placed, while two mirrors, one opposite the other, reflected the crystal chandelier. Bonne Marie had never seen such splendor, and stood transfixed. It is pretty, isn't it? said Clotilde behind her. The young provincial turned around quickly. It is superb, she said, but it must have been frightfully expensive. Clotilde smiled, shrugged her shoulders, and drew her friend toward a low sofa. Tell me your whole story, dear, she said, for you must have had at least one romance in your life. Everyone has as much as that, and besides, but for something of the kind, you would not be here. I have no romance whatever, sighed Bonne Marie. She related to Clotilde all the disastrous events which had made her sole mistress of her fortunes. She unveiled to her friend's eyes all the mysteries of her ambitious young heart. She was not ashamed in Clotilde's presence, for had not her friend reached the end at which she herself now aimed? And therefore was it not clear that Clotilde must know something of the same suspense and aspirations that were now eating her own heart away? No romance, not the smallest one in the world, insisted the singer. Bonne Marie shook her head, but at the same time blushed as she thought of Jean-Baptiste, for her conscience reproached her, and yet she did not care to give up the fisherman's name as subject for jesting to her brilliant friend. "'Well, well,' cried Clotilde gaily, "'you are certainly a most extraordinary young woman. The idea of you coming to Paris to make your fortune and to hope to do it by honest labour with your two hands—' "'But you?' asked Bonne Marie. Was it not your talent which gave you all these pretty things? Clotilde smiled, but did not reply immediately. You must make a good, a great deal of money, said the girl. Of course I do, answered Clotilde, jumping up. Now come to breakfast. The dining room indicated the same comfort, elegant without pretension, which is the true luxury of those persons who do not care to throw handfuls of money out the window. Nothing was less like a feudal chateau than this pretty box, but all that modern taste had introduced was found within reach. The two pretty women seated themselves opposite each other and chatted gaily while they tasted the dainties which had hitherto been a sealed book to Bonne Marie, and now made her open her eyes in wonder. The window looked out on the leafy garden of a great hotel. The sun, softened by the green blinds, flashed an occasional golden ray on the crystal sharafs and on the well-kept silver. End of chapter 10 Recording by Susanna Mason Chapter 11 of Bonne Marie This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Gerville Translated by Mary Neil Sherwood. Chapter 11. A New Idea. It is needless to say that Mademoiselle Beslin intensely enjoyed this glimpse of a luxurious, indolent life, so entirely unlike her own. Clotilde told her own story, in very general terms, let us state here, and her school friend listened in breathless amazement. The debut of the diva, her first triumph, all that heady wine of celebrity intoxicated her. But, said Bonne Marie after a time, what was it that put into your head to go on to the stage? Clotilde smiled and played with the fruit on her plate. I was urged to do it, she said at last, with a little movement of the pretty shoulders to which was due a great part of her success. Who urged you? continued her curious friend. A man of wit and celebrity. Where did you make his acquaintance? At church. At church? repeated Bonne Marie. Why, it is a real romance. "'No, indeed, no romance whatever,' replied Clotilde carelessly. "'You know I came to Paris to give lessons in singing and on the piano at a boarding school. "'And then? "'Well, I had a good voice, and I have it still. "'I was wretchedly paid for the lessons I gave eight hours in the day.' "'How much were you paid?' asked Bonne Marie, always eager for information. Forty francs per month. I was compelled to sleep in the dormitory with the younger children, and to take care of them at night. I was fed and my washing was done, and what food and what washing! And those children! Shall I ever forget them?" Clotilde sank in her chair and laughed. Bonne Marie laughed too, 
but the undercurrent of anxiety at her heart caused her to return to her practical questions. "'Well, then you gave lessons?' "'Yes, and they made me sing in the parish church during the month of May. "'Ah, my dear, I made a perfect revolution there. "'Never had the good women who went there in the evening heard anything like it. "'They brought their husbands, and finally it came to pass that a newspaper man came in. "'He wrote an article, and one fine evening the church was so full of amateurs "'that it was no longer a church. It was a concert. "'And your boarding-school mistress?' She said it was a disgrace, that was one of her favorite phrases, and announced to me that I was no longer to attend the services in honor of the Holy Virgin. And why, pray? Why? Well, it would be really difficult to say. She had three reasons, the first being that she feared lest I should discover that forty francs per month and a bed in the dormitory with the children was hardly payment for the services I rendered her. The second was that she was jealous of me. "'Jealous? And of what?' "'Of everything,' answered Clotilde, throwing her head back haughtily. "'Of my beauty, my intelligence, and my success. The third reason, ah, the third. And Diva hummed the air sung by Paris in La Belle Hélène. The third there was, I am certain, but I never found out what it was, I believe.' At all events, I just as usual came downstairs with my hat on, the next night at a quarter to eight to go with my class to church. As soon as she saw me, she forbade my going. And what did you do? I bowed politely and went out in front of her, and directly to the church, and took the place where I was in the habit of sitting. She had not dreamed of my doing this, and when she entered the chapel, I was singing the Ave Maria Stella. Ah, oh, my dear! sighed Clotilde. I don't think I ever sang so well before or since. I can understand that, cried Bonne Marie eagerly. And then what happened? The journalist of whom I spoke was there, and when I went out, he was waiting for me on the steps, and he made me such compliments as were quite enough to turn a girl's head. He handed me his card and told me to appeal to him whenever I needed his services. I thanked him, of course, and took the card. When I rang at the door of the pension, uh, for I was, of course, a good deal after hours, the servant opened the door and handed me my clothes done up in a bundle, and my last wages wrapped up in paper. I was dismissed, or rather not to put too fine a point upon it. I was kicked out of doors, and pleased to remember, without any certificate. Bonne Marie, in utter consternation, looked at her friend, who laughed in great glee. Yes, I laugh now. But I did not laugh then, I assure you. I slept that night in a garret inhabited by fleas, and the next morning I called on the journalist, a most charming man. Old? Young, my dear, young and handsome and kind. He at once did his best to find a position for me. This did not seem to be a very easy matter, but in the meantime I sang in several churches, thanks to his recommendations, and then one morning I was breakfasting with him and I met— What? "'You breakfasted with him?' "'Oh, I, I sometimes did. "'Well, then, this day, as I was telling you, "'I met the manager of a concert troupe, "'a café concert troupe, you understand. "'They asked me to sing, and I did so, "'and the manager was delighted, "'and finally, to cut a long story short, "'he engaged me, and I sing every night.' "'You will take me to hear you, will you not?' "'cried Bonne Marie eagerly. "'You can hear me now, if you choose.' answered the diva, running to her piano in the next room, where, after a little prelude, she sang an aria from an operetta, then much in vogue, with so much expression in her rich voice that Bonne Marie was thrilled from head to foot. But the strange words, the mocking intonation which made the success of the part, bewildered our little country girl. "'Do you mean that you sing such songs as those before people?' she asked in horror as La Diva twirled round suddenly on the piano stool and clapped her hands with an air of irresistible fun and mischief. "'They like it,' said Clotilde, with an audacious wink. "'Now come and see all my pomades and paints, and my brushes with which I ornament my face. It is ridiculous, to be sure, for I am far prettier, in my opinion, when I let myself alone, and appear just as the good Lord made me.' Bonne Marie, with a certain vague repugnance, followed her friend into the dressing-room, and contemplated the various articles whose use and meaning were carefully explained by her friend. The diva, now a thorough Parisian, 
took the greatest possible delight in watching the impressions she made on her friend. It seemed to revive in herself something of the innocence and ignorance that had been hers, before she was launched into the corruption of her present life. After a long talk wherein Clotilde had always answered, and Bonne Marie always questioned, a silence followed, and the two friends, each curled in her own corner of the couch, looked at each other with frank curiosity and interest. "'And you, what do you mean to do?' asked Clotilde, finally, when she had terminated her mental inventory of the attractions of her companion. "'I do not know,' answered Bonne with a gesture of profound discouragement. "'Can you sing? You sang once.' "'Yes, I know I did, but I rarely do now.' "'Sing something this moment,' and Clotilde ran back to the piano. "'But I do not know anything, nothing but our old sentimental ballads and romances which we used to sing at boarding school.' "'Sing one of those. It will be very droll.' Bonne Marie began one of the preposterous melodies which belonged to the times of our grandmothers, and which are still found in the repertoire of some of the establishments for education of young ladies. By degrees her voice grew firm, and she succeeded in imparting to the insipid words an extraordinary amount of expression, and galvanized them as it were into life. "'You have sung that infinitely better than I could have done,' cried Clotilde. "'Why do you laugh at me?' said Bonne Marie reproachfully. "'Why do I laugh at you, Goose?' replied her friend. "'I am not laughing. What I say is true. You have a way of pronouncing the words heaven, birds, and flowers that I could never achieve were I to practice it a hundred years. You must have felt all this. You have done your share of dreaming, I fancy.' The country girl coloured. "'And yet you say you love no one.' "'No one but you?' Clotilde smiled, and rolled one of her glossy curls over her finger, and then, as she tossed it lightly back over her shoulder, she said, "'I am unlike you, then, for I do love someone. Who is he?' "'He is rich, and a businessman. Young? Of course I detest old men. And then, too, one can be young but once.' Bonne Marie looked at her friend questioningly. It was clear that her mind was not quite at ease. "'You see him, then?' daily do you of course i do he dines here to-day and you will marry him clotilde gave a strange forced laugh no she said i think not but that does not prevent me from loving him quite the contrary i think she pronounced this aphorism with such superb aplomb that bonne marie was entirely out of countenance and did not know what to say "'You are too innocent by far,' resumed Clotilde. "'But it will not last. "'I have no concern on that score. "'But in the meantime try to find out the things you want to know "'without asking so many questions. "'I think you will find that method more satisfactory. "'And now, tell me, do you wish to sing in public as I do?' "'Bonne Marie clasped her hands in an ecstasy of delight, but did not speak.' "'With your Madonna-like face,' continued Clotilde, "'you would make a signal failure if you should attempt my style. "'But sentiment is your forte. "'Some people like that sort of thing. "'Shall I present you to my manager? "'He never refuses me anything.' "'Bonne Marie nearly smothered her friend with kisses. "'Now then, be off with you,' exclaimed Clotilde, laughing. "'This is the hour that Joseph is due.' "'Joseph?' "'Who's Joseph, your servant?' "'No, indeed. Men in society affect that style of name nowadays, and servants are all Arthurs and Raouls. Joseph is, well, he's my best friend. I wish you to make his acquaintance, but not today. Come to me again tomorrow at the same hour.'" End of chapter 11 Recording by Susanna Mason Chapter 12 of Bonne Marie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Gerville. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 12. Signing the Contract. Bonne Marie found herself on the street again, just as the heat of the day had began to decrease. The shadows of the trees lengthened on the Champs Elysees. The spray of the fountains mingled with the dust of the macadamia's pavements, and made a sort of mist around the large chestnut trees. The carriages had begun their evening activity, and all was bright and gay. 
Bonne Marie thought she would go and look at the outside of the Café Chantant. Yes, she said to herself, I will sing there if I can. She went home past the flower market of the Madeleine, where even the flowers have an air of effrontery. The Parma violets were out of season and were pale and listless, and as to the white roses it was easy to see that they would fade that night in the loge of some actress. But Bonne Marie had no such intentions as these. She bought a bouquet for four sous and took it to her wretched little room where she dreamed until morning of applause, of flaring gas and of bouquets surrounded by lace paper. Yes, ma belle, it is all settled said Clotilde to her friend, the next day, toward the end of breakfast. Morissette will give you a hearing next week. Morissette? asked Bonne Marie quickly. Yes, the old wretch, my manager. The country girl asked herself with a shiver how any one could venture to speak of such an autocrat with so little ceremony. A manager, of course, was to be respected not only for his age, but for his position. Clotilde was not sufficiently parliamentary in her language. I have a word of warning to whisper in your ear, my dear said Clotilde. Look out for the manager. Look out for him, and why? You must find out for yourself. Only remember my words, for they are words of wisdom. Shall we say Monday? Will you be ready? Any time you please, Clotilde. At this very moment, if you say so. Bless your dear little heart, cried the diva. If you were to go to see Morissette in that little black woolen gown and sing that romance for him, he would insist on you paying him five hundred francs for permission to make your debut under his auspices. Your eyes might be like stars and as large as moons. It would make no difference. But then how shall I go to him? In the most distingué toilettes possible. Black fur, linen collar, not a scrap of lace, but ample drapery and more ample aplomb. But that would cost much money, and simpleton, you need not pay now. I will take you to my dressmaker. All you need trouble yourself about is a dozen pair of gloves. Are your hands presentable? Bonne Marie held them out to Clotilde with a shamefaced air. Red, very red, but the skin is fine and they are very well shaped. Wear gloves with sixteen buttons for your debut, and don't let human eye rest on your hands until they are white. And how long will that be? asked the girl with timid anxiety. Clotilde went off in a fit of laughter. She is delicious. On my word, she is truly delicious. But don't you see, ma belle, that if your hands have nothing to do but grow white, it cannot take very long. You must select two or three romances more appropriate than the one you sang yesterday. We will try over half a dozen, and you will have two of them before Monday. With such able instructions on all points, Bonne Marie found the day of her interview with the manager close at hand, and on the fateful Monday morning, with her hair dressed by a coiffure, and wearing the lightest possible gloves, and embarrassed by the numerous flounces of her silk robe, the girl entered the presence of the redoubtable Morisset, encouraged by her brilliant friend. "'Here she is, Monsieur Morisset, here she is, this deep-sea pearl, this pearl of price. She has as much talent as she has beauty, I do assure you.' "'That is precisely what we wish to discover.' grumbled the potentate, hardly looking at Bonne Marie, such was his eagerness to press a kiss upon the hand of La Diva, who gave him in return a friendly little slap on his cheek. Sing us something, he said imperiously to the trembling girl. What shall I sing? she asked. Anything you choose, it is of very little consequence what. Go on. These words were not especially encouraging. He seated himself comfortably in an armchair in front of the piano. Clotilde, drawing off her gloves, placed herself at the instrument, and Bonne Marie, suddenly warming up, sang one of those sentimental ballads which please fifty out of every hundred persons who hear it, far more than any higher order of music could have done. "'Not so bad,' said Morissette coldly. "'And this is all you can do?' "'We warble, Monsieur Morissette,' said Clotilde gravely. "'We do nothing but that. But we do that well.' Ah, to be sure, I see. You adopt the simple style? Bonne Marie could find nothing to say in reply. Some people like that sort of a thing, continued the manager. Now, try again. The young girl, encouraged by a malicious glance from Clotilde, sang another ballad, which since then has made the tour of the world. At that time, however, that Bonne Marie sang it, it was fresh and new. That might do, said the manager. 
yes indeed particularly now that amy soliel has gone and you have no one to replace her as yet added clotilde with the most innocent air in the world Morissette looked at her angrily. "'How much will you give me?' he said, turning to Bonne Marie. "'If I should engage you.' "'Nonsense!' interposed Clotilde, drawing up her beautiful figure to its full height. "'Go, my dear, into the other room and wait for me. I do not need you now. This is my part of the business.' Bonne Marie left the salon with tears in her eyes. "'Upon my word, Clotilde,' said Morissette sulkily, I think you might treat me with a little more respect in the presence of my people. Oh, wretch, replied the unabashed diva, with a shrug of those shoulders, famed throughout Paris. She will never be one of your people unless you are more amiable than you are today. What do you intend to give her? To give her? Why, you don't expect me to pay her, do you? No, indeed, I don't care for her in that way. Very well, then. Not one note will I sing tonight and Clotilde walked toward the door. Morissette looked at her. "'You will not sing?' he exclaimed in utter amazement. "'We will see whether you do or not.' "'See as much as you please. I am ill. "'I will send my physicians to examine you.' "'Don't trouble yourself. "'He will find me in bed with leeches on. "'I have a fever.' "'You will sing. "'Fever or no fever?' I will put a mustard plaster on the end of my nose, and I will have it spread round the theatre you have struck me. No one will believe it. Indeed, you are mistaken. Everybody will believe any hateful thing I choose to say of you. The diva gathered up her skirts. Good morning, Monsieur Morissette, she said with a serene smile. I will call tomorrow at the same hour to ascertain if you have changed your mind. Clotilde. What is it? It is simply ridiculous to expect me to engage this girl. Ridiculous? It is you who are ridiculous, cried the haughty Clotilde, dropping her silk with a noise that sounded like the unreefing of sails. Look at it yourself. You are lucky enough to have me bring to you a beautiful girl, well-educated and well-bred, with a delicate voice and accent. That of Cherbourg. Cherbourg, interrupted Morisset. In eight days there will be not a trace of it left continued Clotilde, quite undisturbed. Her voice is the most touching and sympathetic I have ever heard in my life, and after bringing tears into the eyes of all the crocodiles in Paris. She is a girl who is made for love, and yet she is pure and good. Pure and good, repeated Morissette with a sceptical air. Pure and good, you wretch! So good she asked me if I did not receive an enormous salary to enable me to furnish my house so well. And what did you say? None of your business. You must have given her a very erroneous idea of your engagement with me, Clotilde. This, permit me to say, was a very great mistake. Do you dare to say that you do not give me twenty-five thousand francs for singing six months? But that is you, Clotilde. Do you suppose I could do the same for anyone else? Guess in one moment, if you found anyone who sang better than I, replied the diva haughtily. But you have not yet discovered one. I have not discovered one, answered the manager, simply because I do not look for one. You have looked, and you did not succeed. You offered Planot thirty thousand francs. You made your offer in black and white, and she refused it. She has not the half of a voice, while well, I, I have a voice and a half. You are perfectly ungrateful. Clotilde, I swear to you, I have read your letter. And as Clotilde uttered these crushing words, she crossed her arms and looked the manager straight in the eyes. She found him so droll in his demoralized condition that she laughed aloud. Who in the thunder showed you that letter? A little bird, answered Clotilde. The manager bowed his abashed head. Don't let us quarrel, he said with a paternal air. Do you insist on my engaging your friend? absolutely or i will not sing another note for you i feel that my voice is leaving me entirely in another twenty-five hours i shall not be able to raise a note said the actress in a hoarse whisper well then i will give her three hundred francs per month that is liberal i am sure and dress her said clotilde slyly ah no indeed by no means then double your price and we will think about it do you mean that six hundred francs would not be enough? Now, how bright you are! Who would have supposed that you could have thought I meant that? And Clotilde laughed. 
How much do you want for her? Asked the manager impatiently. Eight thousand francs for the first year, twelve for the next, and after then to agree on new terms. Clotilde, you are mad, cried Morissette. The actress raised her eyebrows in a gentle wonder. Let me tell you, she said, that my friend is a very quiet little person. She means to marry a rich man. Ah, oh, answered Morissette thoughtfully, that changes the question entirely. If she has decided to marry, it will not be at once, I presume. Not until she had brought a quantity of fish to your net, at all events, cried Clotilde. I will give her ten thousand francs on condition that she will not marry until after the expiration of the first year. Trafficker in human flesh, groaned Clotilde. And yet people pretend that the buying and selling of slaves is abolished. Then, if she engages at ten thousand, you will give her cash down. Two thousand. One thousand the day of her first appearance. How do you wish her to appear? In a flannel skirt and a nightcap? Upon my word, that would not be a bad idea, said Morissette, caressing his moustache. But I will give half now and the other half in six months. No, two thousand this very moment where I will take her off, and you will never see either of us again. Morissette reluctantly opened his iron safe and took out two bills for one thousand francs each and handed them to Clotilde. How many sighs and groans and maledictions against the manager these represent, said the actress as she took them. You cannot boast of being very liberal at all events. I am quite as liberal as others, said Morissette as he prepared a receipt and contract. I am not so sure of that replied Clotilde. Let me see the conditions with which you propose to burthen that poor innocent. Give me that pen. Clotilde took her seat at the manager's desk and pugnaciously attacked every clause which she considered onerous for her protégé. When all was triumphantly concluded, after a long and weary battle, she rose and told her companion to read, ponder, and inwardly reflect. You may boast of taking the most abominable advantage of your position, he sighed as he laid the paper down. Oh! If only I could replace you. But that is precisely what you cannot do. Therefore, it is you who take advantage of your position. She answered with a laugh. Bonne Marie was now summoned. The period of her waiting had been so long that she had lost all hope and supposed herself to have been condemned and rejected. Her surprise, therefore, was all the greater on seeing the contract and the receipt ready for her signature. And she took the pen handed her by Clotilde, almost without knowing what she was doing. "'Put your name there, simpleton,' said her friend, showing her the exact spot to affix her signature. "'And here, put these in your pocket.' She slipped into the hand of Bonne Marie the two thousand franc notes, at which the girl stared with affrighted eyes. "'She is pretty, very pretty,' said Morissette, examining her through his eyeglass. Oh, "'What shall we call her?' "'The Rose of Salency,' said Clotilde with a laugh. "'We shall have to think about it.' He answered meditatively, and while Bonne Marie put her precious money carefully into her porte-monnaie, he approached the diva and whispered in her ear, "'Why the deuce do you have anything to do with this girl? She is as pretty as a pink. Why are you not jealous of her?' "'We do not pursue the same game,' said Clotilde, quietly. "'She is after a husband, and I, well, you know, I think a husband.' "'I know you are too independent, mademoiselle.' interrupted Morissette. And now, ladies, good-bye until the evening. Clotilde bore her friend away in triumph. Bonne Marie moved as if she were half asleep, and wondered if it were not all a dream. End of chapter 12. Recording by Susanna Mason. Chapter 13 of Bonne Marie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Greville. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 13. Her First Appearance. When it was known that Morissette had engaged a new attraction, the artist attached to his troupe became very curious. The men, contrary to the received idea, more curious than the women. But for Clotilde, who never left her, Bonne Marie would unquestionably have suffered much annoyance. At the first glance the lady called her an affected thing, and the men a beauty. Such contradictory opinions as these naturally led to many collisions. 
but the whole troop stood in wholesome fear of Clotilde, whose exceptional position and unrestrained tongue were for Bonne Marie the best possible shield and buckler. Several rehearsals were ordered, that the new star might become accustomed to the orchestra and the glare of the gas. The important day at last arrived. Handbills were freely circulated. The milky globes surrounding the enclosure were more clear than usual, and there was a more liberal allowance of gas lighting up the dusky acacias. The floating dust of the summer evening was transformed to luminous vapor, and against this background the heavy masses of foliage and the tall trees stood out distinctly. Here and there branches caught the light from some candelabra and displayed their delicate tracery even to their palest green leaves, as they waved in the air which was not so much the wind of heaven as the heated air from the gas burners. The enclosure was surrounded by evergreens, which were intended to protect the little theatre from profane eyes. That this intention was not successful was shown by the quadruple row of heads beyond it. There assembled regularly every night those persons whose purses were empty, and who obtained during the day only the smell of the meals at the restaurants, and by night only the echoes from the theatre, those who do not love work enough even to struggle on with it, that they may thereby win the means of enjoying a few hours of indolence, those who, like neither the solitary fireside of the bachelor, nor the crowded home of the married man, those who say every morning, Monsieur was not in voice yesterday, or Julia's ballad was hissed, thus giving themselves the air of men of elegant leisure. All the endless varieties of the same family were to be found in this spot, attracted by the handbills and the placards, but too poor to pay the entrance fee. There were also artists there, who came to catch certain effects of the light, for these places are not without their poetic side, as Alfred de Musset has proved to us. Beyond these heads, beyond the evergreens and the line of lights, people passing by caught a glimpse of a brilliant gulf, with beds of flowers each side, flowers which quickly withered in this unhealthy light and atmosphere. Beyond this was the stage, protected by its triple row of gas burners, and there, on this stage, set with scenery of trees and meadows, stood Marie, in white silk, her dress cut square and low over the bust. She was singing in pathetic tones, in which real emotion was so interwoven with the false and the assumed, that she herself did not know where the one began and the other ended. J'ai écouté, monsieur en boucault, pour venir dans la grande ville. And there was a tear in her voice as she went on to describe the grief of the orphan as she met the cold looks of the hard world. She elicited enthusiastic applause from her audience by the gesture and voice in which she, although dying of hunger, repulsed the gold, the price of shame. And these people, skeptics and cynics, applauded her with energy. Bonne Marie, without suspecting it, had infused a new element into the Ola Puridia of Parisian life. She had sung a moral ballad at a café chantant with success. It was an absolute ovation. Vainly did her companions shrug their shoulders and turn their backs on the girl who had dropped, as it were, from the skies among them. All true musicians recognized the peculiar quality of her fresh, clear voice, and all realized that there was something extraordinary about her, a dignity and a charm which prevented her being approached other than with the most entire respect. The amateurs and habitués of the place came, of course, to see this rising star, or this budding star, as a youth with a vast display of shirt bosom and hair carefully parted in the middle solemnly remarked to her. Bonne Marie smiled, and even exchanged a few courteous words with one and all, but no one ventured on any impertinent familiarity. "'How the deuce does she do it? Why is she so different from all the others?' said some to Morissette. "'Hush!' said the astute manager, placing his finger on his lips. She is a young lady of the best possible family. Hush! Who makes her appearance here out of love of you? Hush! Heart of ice has never loved. Will not listen to one such word. Hush! Come now, Morissette, let us be serious. I am serious, entirely so. Try yourself, gentlemen. Burn your own wings in the flame if you choose and Morissette laughed softly and went off on the tips of his toes as if in a sick room. "'The rascal! He is quite capable of having put that clause into her engagement!' exclaimed someone who builded better than he knew. That evening Bonne Marie returned to her pretty room on the fourth floor of a good house in a good situation. It was a room for birds of passage, which the coquetry and doubtful taste of third-class actresses, on the topmost wave of success for a brief period, had adorned and arrayed. 
but it seemed to the young girl the very acme of elegance. A carriage full of bouquets had been brought in, and as she read the cards attached to them, and breathed their perfume, Bonne Marie's heart beat with a more exalted triumph than this apartment had ever before witnessed. "'I am earning my bread honorably,' she said to herself. A strong wind from the southeast blew against her imperfectly closed window. The curtain swelled out like a sail. She opened it, leaned out, and looked up at the sky over which black clouds were stormily drifting. "'How high the sea must be tonight at Almonville,' thought Bonne Marie. She closed the windows and was soon sound asleep after her day of fatigue and excitement. That very night Jean Baptiste, who had grown indifferent and careless, was nearly lost, he and his boat together on the Cove, the most dangerous of all the huge rocks on this perilous shore, and if he saved himself it was simply that his instinct of self-preservation was stronger than his love of life. End of chapter 13 Recording by Susanna Mason Chapter 14 of Bonne Marie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Greville. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 14. Lucian. In another week, Bonne Marie had totally conquered her Normand accent. Bonne Marie could use a fan in answer to her new name, Lucian. A name chosen by Clotilde. Bonne Marie was no longer embarrassed by her trailing flounces. In a word, the young country girl was transformed into a Parisian. Where had she learned to receive all this homage in so calm and dignified a manner? How did she know what replies to make to these commonplace sentimentalities? She unfolded her music and looked over it at the public while the prelude was played, with as much composure as if she had done it for years. She must have been born for this role, for she assumed it with such ease that even Clotilde was astonished and had some difficulty in believing that their meeting on the Champs-Élysées was but little more than a month previous. Bonne Marie had learned many things without knowing how, like water filtering through a porous stone. She had acquired a knowledge of the immortality of the world in which she lived. She understood the puerile hatreds, the ferocious jealousy, the venality of all and everything the absolute selfishness and vanity of those about her, and she no longer cared to know Clotilde's friends. She even suspected that Clotilde herself had not escaped the odious leprosy, and that poor and honest friends would stand small chance of being admitted to her august presence. But she loved Clotilde, and she wished to continue to love her. She was grateful for the battle Clotilde had fought in her behalf, and brought to a successful termination— a battle in which she, standing alone, would have been hopelessly defeated and put to flight. It was to Clotilde that she owed the applause that nightly deafened her. The very carpet in her bedroom was due to her friend's generosity, as well as the bouquets and compliments. So many favors demanded a vast amount of gratitude in return, and so Bonne Marie deliberately closed her eyes and covered them with her hands. Did she think of the past? Yes, often. When in the evening she was dressing for a concert, as she caught the gleam of the light on her pearly skin, as she loosened the mass of her pale brown hair and put it up in a fashion that displayed her pure brow and delicate ears, she remembered the small linen caps which in former days covered these shining braids. She recalled her woolen bodice, the chemise of unbleached linen she then wore, and smiled at her image in the glass with a proud and happy smile. That which raised Bonne Marie higher than all in her own estimation was the feeling that it was impossible for her to wander from the straight and narrow path she had marked out for herself. "'I will owe my fortune to myself, to my own merits,' she said haughtily. Conscious of her own innocence and purity, the girl therefore carried her head high, and never dreamed that she could be suspected. Why should she be? Her life was as transparent as a crystal carafe. Study and rehearsals absorbed her days, and if, by chance, a leisure hour came, she spent it at Clotilde's, or in driving with her and the boys. The young girl's life was therefore a peaceful one, troubled only by a regret for her dead father, or a pang when she thought of the living Jean Baptiste who loved her so much, and who was alone and sad so many miles away. Another month had elapsed. Bonne Marie, or Lucien as she was called, had renewed and enlarged her repertoire. Under the advice of her friend, she appeared always in white, 
always with jasmine or anemones in her hair, and were some small pure flowers which suggested orange blossoms. And this virginal apparition was hailed each night with long and repeated bravas. In the intervals between her ballads, Mademoiselle Lucien received the homage of the men around her, and if a brief melancholy weighed down her spirits, it was at the sight of these among whom, she said to herself, was not one single man whom she could love. "'Not one whom I would marry,' she added. She contemplated these admirers in succession, those who were at her own feet and those who were at the feet of all other women. Their whiskers curled on hot irons, their moustaches waxed to a fine point, their huge collars and cut open vests, their hair parted in the middle, all struck her as simply ridiculous, and her their manners as repulsive. And was this the world of which she had dreamed? Not so. The traveller whom she was to have met on the sea beach at sunset had little in common with this vulgar herd. Were there no men in Paris simpler, more natural, and truer than these? She remembered that on her first arrival in Paris she had often met men with handsome, grave faces, stately in form and walk, men whose eyes expressed an admiration which was too respectful to bring a blush to her cheek, but none such did she see at the café concert. It began to dawn upon her, therefore, that it was not enough to be beautiful, amiable, and clever, and to earn one's bread honestly and industriously. Something else was evidently needed. But what, then, was that something? Bonne Marie said to herself, sagaciously, that the women who were near her were not such as men would select for wives, but she was not one of them, though with them, and the men knew this quite as well as she did herself. And if these men knew it, why should not others as well, and among them the mysterious he whom she was to marry? She was sometimes a little discouraged, but as at twenty, it is more natural to hope than to fear. This discouragement quickly passed away, and she continued to look forward to the future with a vague feeling of expectation. End of chapter 14 Recording by Susanna Mason